All right, so now we can get started. I'm so happy to see you here. And you're always such a blessing. This is our last lesson in the It Is Well With My Soul Bible study. It's been eight weeks. Can you believe that? Eight weeks have gone by. And so in this last lesson, we're going to wrap things up. But first, we're going to look at Matthew 6, a beautiful passage of scripture. In the book and in our lesson, you go through verses 25 through 34. We're going to kind of condense it a little bit and just talk about the main themes in this passage. And then we're going to wrap up everything that we've learned in this Bible study. So let's pray and we can get started. Father, thank you for your many, many blessings. Thank you for hearing our prayers. I thank you for each lady here today and those who have joined throughout this study, Father. They are such a blessing to me, and I know they are a blessing to you when you see them join in to learn more about you, Father. We give you all glory, honor, and praise for this lesson and all these passages of scripture that we can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So these are the passages that we'll be focusing on. And uh, in the lesson, I talked a little bit about my own personal story. But, you know, I mean, with Afghanistan and Haiti and everything that's going on right now in the world, I mean, it's just crazy. And I have had a few friends reach out asking, you know, for prayer because their spouses spent quite a bit of time in Afghanistan over the years and their PTSD is starting up again. Um Blessedly, they have service dogs to help them. But I mean, it's really hitting people hard. You know what happened, what's going on over there. So we're just asking, we're just, you know, they're asking me for prayer. And I just send them these passages that we've been going over with a little blip about what they mean and how we can apply them to our lives. So I can see why God laid it upon my heart eight weeks ago to teach this Bible study because He knew things were going to get crazy, not just with the world events, but with the weather, you know, and things like that. In Arizona, it's just crazy. It's a blessing. We need the rain. So it has been a blessing. But my friend has a police scanner and she was listening to the scanner the other day on about all the people who got stranded in the roads, or the floods and everything. So, I mean, it's just crazy right now. Not that it's never been crazy before. It has been, and we understand that. But I'm just so grateful for these Bible verses and this lesson that we can, you know, all these lessons, this Bible study, that we can go through and rely upon them when things, when we see things, hear things going on in the world, we start to freak out and just have tons of anxiety and worry. We can rest. We can definitely rest in knowing that God is still in control. And so for the next uh, Bible study starting up next Thursday, can't believe that's already here. Next Thursday will be Jesus, the better rest, an overview of the book of Hebrews. And they are announcing it at my church. So hopefully we'll have a few women sign up for my church. So you'll see a few names here that maybe you don't know. But uh, it's really neat because on Tuesday mornings, they'll be teaching in the book of Hebrews. And then on Thursday mornings, I'll be teaching the book of Hebrews. And that was not planned. That was just done. And when I found out, I went, what? So I think the Lord really wants us to be in the book of Hebrews right now. Praise God for that, too. So in this lesson, I talked a little bit about how in the education program I was in, we had to learn about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, his motivational theory that he developed way back in the 1940s. And he developed this to assess where people are in their needs. And we used it to assess our students. Because if you had an A student, right, who's really social and just bubbly and having a great time, and she st suddenly starts to come to class disheveled and lethargic 
and she's not social. She's failing in her in her classes and tests. I mean, we teachers would be scratching our heads saying, what is going on with this child? Something happened, right? And then that's when the principal would reach out to the family and find out what's going on. So it's a great way to also assess where you are and where others around you are. So you may have a friend or a family member where they're jolly, they're positive, you know, optimistic, life is great. And then all of a sudden they're withdrawn. They rarely speak to you. When you do see them, they've lost weight or they've gained weight. They're just not social anymore. They're sharp with you, you know, like attack mode. This is a great way to remember that unless our very basic needs are met, we can't process, we can't go on to other uh, parts of this pyramid phases in our life leveling up without that foundation. And so last year, when a lot of people were experiencing the COVID thing, um, I had people on both sides, friends who were teachers and friends who were parents. And my friends who were parents, they were really full of anxiety and worry. They would come into work, you know, having hardly slept because their kids were now home, but they had to come to work and they didn't have enough PTO time to go and be home with their kids. And so they were wondering, what are we going to do? How are we going to do online learning with our kids when we're working full time? They were stressed especially with the cost of childcare and everything, they, they really didn't know what to do. And then I had teachers who were on Facebook complaining, you know, oh, I can't believe these parents are more concerned with, you know, setting up classrooms at home than what they're going to be missing, you know, science and history lessons and quizzes and things that students need to know. And so I immediately went on there and posted this pyramid to remind my friends in the education business about Maslow's because they already knew they just forgotten the parents and the kids their psychological and safety their security needs were not being met they were wiped out and so everything else just comes crumbling down so I reminded my friend you know your history lessons and quizzes are important but right now these parents can't think about that all they're thinking about are their children and how are they going to get them through these next few months. And once she saw that, she was reminded, you're right. Unless a person's most basic needs are being met, anything else, just it just doesn't matter. So that's why if you go to a homeless person on the street and you say, I'm praying for you, and you tell them the gospel message, Unless they've eaten that day, unless they know where they're going to be sleeping that night, unless they know they feel safe, they're not going to hear a word you're saying. So that's why the Salvation Army, their motto is soup, soap, salvation, because they know let's get their bellies full. Let's get them clean with some clean clothes, sit them down, and then we can tell them the gospel message. But if you rearrange that order, it's just not going to happen. And Jesus, being the master teacher, he understood this. So when he taught the people who were seated before him about how God meets all their needs, he revealed his understanding of our innermost needs and not just our outer physical needs, right? When he said, do not worry about your life and what you're going to eat and drink and clothes and all that, he, he, he went right to their deepest inner needs. And so that's how we can help people the most when we remember that they do have needs. And sometimes in our country, we're one of you know, the wealthiest country in the world. And if you have never been to parts of India or Nepal, you know, or Haiti, then you just can't possibly understand what poverty really is. And my former pastor used to go to India many times and he'd come back and say you know we complain about the carpet on our floors or the tile you know or outdated kitchen he goes well let me tell you i've sat in homes where they have dirt and mats to sleep on and that's it he said so if you have carpet on your floor 
or tile, you are rich. You are rich, even if you don't have anything else, right? And that helped me put things in proper perspective because our country, we've got it made here. We Christians are doing well. And when we think of what the Christians are going through in Afghanistan right now, they are in fear of their lives. The missionaries there are in caves. They are hiding with nothing but the clothes on their backs because they know the Taliban is coming. Yet they've gotten word out to other missionaries here in the United States saying, pray for us. We are willing to die for our faith, but pray for us that we can go in a way that glorifies God. <clears throat> so we need, <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves, why is God allowing this to happen right now in the world? And I think a great part of it is for the church, an awakening in the church, a revival in the church to put him first in all things and to remember these verses. Do not worry about anything, right? Because God will meet our needs. And we're going to see it happen in Afghanistan. We're going to see God meet their needs. I've been praying fervently for God to bind the enemy of his people and restrain them, but also for the glory of God to go before his people. So when they are dragged out of the caves and you know brought before a firing squad or whatever, however they will meet their fate, that they will be singing hymns of praise, that they will be crying out the name of Jesus, that like Stephen in the book of Acts, they will just be glowing with the Lord, the power of God within them, so that the enemy who stands before them will know that God, the God of the Bible, is the one true God, and they will be saved. Because I know that's what these missionaries want more than anything, is to go out like Stephen, glorifying God, praying for God to forgive the enemies and to glorify God as they see him. And so that's where we need to be, ladies. Are we? Are we there? If they were to come banging on our door right now to haul us off to prison, would we be fighting them and cursing them? Or would we be glorifying God? That's the question that I have been dealing with all week. What would I do if I were in that situation? What would I do? So I'm going to tune in tonight to a podcast um, video episode about what's going on in Afghanistan with the missionaries there. And I put the link in our chat there. If you want to sign up, it's free. It will be 8 a.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Central Time. Um, and with the If Gathering Ministry. So if you want to tune into that. And we are seeing with our eyes how these verses apply. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, therefore your thoughts, your heart, your inner soul will be. And we're seeing that being played out right now all over the world. The missionaries in Haiti are crying out, saying, pray for us. The people here are hurting from the earthquake and now a tropical storm. But he said, they are all praising Jesus. The people there are praising Jesus and crying out during this difficult time. Our thoughts and minds should be heaven focused and not focused on the earth. And I know it's hard. Believe me, it's hard. I know when things are going wrong and the house you know, has water damage from the storms that just hit or Financial pressures are getting to you or health pressures. You know, I found out today a good friend of mine is having serious health issues. God knows all of these problems. He does. Even before you speak them, he knows. And he has a plan. And that plan is perfect. And we are learning that we can trust in that plan. If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and trust in his plan, we can be heaven focused and not earth focused. It can be done. God as the father, Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. 
And like I said, I always have my little bird bath right there in view. And I saw this little fat sparrow land there this morning and take a bath right in there, splashing around. And then he flew off and it was so cute. It reminded me of this verse. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Yes, you are. You are of significant more value than they are. So rest in that. Worry less. Trust more. Now, I asked you to go through and summarize what you've learned so far from all the lessons in this Bible study. And I hope that you've learned that these verses are applicable to your life. That even though they were written thousands of years ago, we can apply them right now. And that's the beauty of God's word. I know that's what I've learned, that these verses that I've heard pretty much since I was a kid, right, in Sunday school and church and Bible studies, that I can go back and read them again and get new insights from these verses I've known almost all my life. That's the beauty of God's word. That's what I've learned. So I trust that you had a chance to jot down some ideas. Now, if God, your father, takes care of creation, how does that give you comfort when you're facing your needs right now? He says, you know, these are the greatest needs, food, clothing, clean water, right? Safety. God understands that. And he takes care of the birds of the air. So he will take care of your needs. And, you know, the other day I went shopping and saw that inflation is causing prices to go up and contents to go down, right? And I started to get angry and panic, but no, I had to remember, stop. There are people in other countries right now with barely anything to eat. So just stop. And I was like, you're right. You're right. Focus on what God has given me enough. He gives us enough. Clothing. Yes, I shared the story in the lesson about when my son noticed that I was just throwing all this money away to try and keep up with appearances with all the other women that I work with. I was trying desperately to look like they did. And I was spending about 200 bucks a month. And my son was like, Mom, you could be saving that money. And I immediately was convicted. I said, You're right. This is crazy. I have enough clothes, enough. I have enough shoes. This is crazy. I need to stop, you know, enough spending. And so I instead started saving that money, you know, and in six or seven months, I had quite a bit of money saved. So I was so grateful that God used my son to convict me. We have enough food. We have enough clothing. What about safety? The craziness of the world, right? The Taliban in power again. They just released 5,000 Al Qaeda prisoners from a prison in Afghanistan. That causes great concern. But God, I need to remember, we all need to remember that God is in control. And on September 11th, 2001, it looked like the end of the world. I remember that day vividly. And so many of my friends were in pure panic mode, taking all their money out of the bank because they thought for sure Wall Street and the banks would collapse and wondering if we were at war. It was a scary time. And I remember going on a prayer walk that evening and just praying and seeing people outside holding candles and praying too, gathering together to pray. And God got us through. And we have yet to have such a serious terrorist attack on this nation in 20 years. Praise God. That's all because of him and using our troops overseas to protect us here at home. Praise God for that. So when it looks like we may not be so safe and it looks like the floodwaters are rising and you see the animals gathering two by two and you start to get scared wondering what is God doing? We need to stop. And have faith and remember God's promises. He will meet our needs. It's not about religion, remember? It's not about religion. It is a close, personal relationship with God. 
when his son said, do not worry, we need to listen to him. When he tells us that God provides for creation, he surely will provide for you. We need to listen to him. He is a shepherd who leads his sheep. He doesn't bark orders and commands from behind. He leads us and he will keep us safe. And Jesus adds this, the futility of worrying. I share a story in the lesson about how my mom, she was like the world champion of warriors. I'd be asleep and hear her fiddling around in the living room. And I crawl out of my bed, like at age 10 or 11, I'd say, mom, what are you doing? And she'd say, I can't sleep until your brothers and sisters are home. It was like a Friday night and they were out at a party or a dance or something. And she would just pace the floor until everybody was home and then she'd go to sleep. That's craziness. And she worried constantly until the day she died. And Jesus, and I used to remind her of this, mom, Jesus says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a statue, stature, one year to your life? Your worrying doesn't change anything. But why do we worry? Because I think deep down inside, we think it does change things. We think our worrying has power behind it, more powerful than God. That we trust God, but I still worry because it makes me feel like I'm participating in what's going on. And when I see my child get home safely, I credit my worrying. See, my worrying worked. And that's how my mom used to be. But I would remind her of these verses in Matthew. Mom, God says, you know, not to worry. It it does nothing. But trust in him. And she'd say, I know, I know, I know. But, and then she would keep worrying. So as I, you know, became a mom, I fell for that too and would worry, you know, about my son. And then I remember thinking, no, just give it over to the Lord. And all was well. And I remember sleeping well, even though I knew he was at a party or at a friend's house or a dance, I still slept well. For me, the real anxiety and fear didn't happen until I experienced a traumatic loss. The loss of my mom was trauma. And after that, I started having anxiety and fear. You know, the what if this happens and what if that happens? And so I had to remind myself of what I used to tell my mom. Don't worry. It does nothing. Doesn't change anything. God's plan is set. Trust in him. And that's what helps me fall back to sleep. Worrying adds nothing to our lives. It's wasted energy that could be put to better use, worshiping and praying to God. And so when you're laying in bed at night, wondering what if this happens and what if that happens and and you stop and you start praying and reciting verses, that's worship. You are worshiping God by telling him, I trust you, that your ways are perfect. That's worship. So Jesus said, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So how beautiful that is, right? How beautiful that is that he points to the landscape to remind the people seated at his feet of God's mercy and his love. Jesus took his audience back to creation time and time again. The birds, right? the flowers. He reminds them and us, since I love to buy clothes, he's reminding me especially, that there's no need to worry about clothing or anything because God takes care of our needs. And I've saved so much money since working from home because I'm not seeing all the different clothes at work and thinking, oh, I need to buy a skirt like that. Or, oh, I love her shoes. I need shoes like that. Or, you know, I need to keep up with the style. So over this last year, I've saved quite a bit of money. I walk into my closet and I, yeah, and I put on clothes and I'm saving quite a bit of money. (laughs) So I praise God that he really convicted me of that years ago. And you're right. um, 
Let me read that again, Shelley. It is a way of worrying is a way of living outside of God. When we put our trust in worry, what are we doing? We're not trusting God and we need to stop doing that and trust in him. Obviously, the people at the time of Christ, the early, early church, the first century believers were doing it too. And their threat of persecution far outweighed ours in this country. They were surrounded by Rome and they were oppressed by the Jewish leaders. So for me, these passages remind me of the futility of worrying. The futility of trying to look a certain way to please people, to try and look a certain way that pleases God, right? Futility. It's just not worth it. So instead, Jesus said, please the Lord, please the Lord. Because what do we gain from worrying? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And we need to remember that, right? Because if we forget it, then we remain in our anxiety. And that's not God's plan for our lives. His plan is freedom, liberty, living in freedom in Christ, not bound by the control of our thoughts. God's plan is all about turning our thoughts to him. So let's hold fast to that which is true and not which is foolish. Worrying and fear and anxiety and laying in bed at night thinking, well, what if this happens and that happens? <gasps> no, stop, breathe, exhale, and just repeat to yourself, God is in control. God, you are in control. And yesterday in chapel, we sang the song, The Blessing, where we repeat over and over again, he is with us. He is for us. God, I know you are with me and I know you are for me. So why am I having fear and anxiety? You are always there. When we do that, then we can have that peace. But when we worry, like this lady in that picture, when we are full of worry, what we're saying to him is, I don't trust you, God. I trust you and trust you and trust you all the way up to here. And then I don't trust you. And like Shelly was telling me in the chat room, that's sin. When we are saying, I trust you only this much, God wants us to trust him with everything. When we trust him, we don't worry. When we rely on ourselves, we worry. And that's what I desperately wanted my mom to learn over the years. Now she knows. She's with Jesus and God's kingdom, and she's seen how futile it was to worry. But seek first what Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God. That's our focus. And his righteousness and all of these things shall be added to you. What happened to Abram? We read, remember, Abraham was found faithful and God counted it, he added it to him as righteousness, faithfulness as righteousness. That's what Jesus was reminding the Jewish people in front of him. Remember Abraham, your father? He had faith and trusted God and God added to him righteousness. So if we seek God, his kingdom first and his righteousness, then all of our needs will be met. Maybe not all of our wants, but it's up to us to be able to deduce which is which. Therefore, Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And remember, in the lesson, we looked at the verses that come before these. Where he said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Those are the verses that he that come before Matthew 6. So he's wanting them to remember not to worry about what's here on the earth because they're going to be destroyed, wiped out. The earth is perishing. 
So he's saying, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness because he is eternal. So this verse summarizes the whole passage. It's our true purpose for being here, right? Our true purpose for all material things that were given to us and our spiritual things are to point to God, to further his kingdom. And when we remember that, wow, everything's put into perspective. And that's what we're hearing from the missionaries in Afghanistan. They're saying their true purpose is to put all of the focus on the kingdom of God, furthering his kingdom, getting that gospel message out there. And of course, we're seeing on the news the Taliban saying if they just don't preach, you know, the gospel message, then they can live. But the missionaries coming out of Afghanistan, the, the news coming out of there is no, they're already killing some of us. So we have to trust God. And remember, we cannot be silent, right? Remember Peter in Acts, they were told, you all can keep doing what you're doing, but just don't preach Christ resurrected from the dead. You know, just don't preach about Jesus. And Peter said, well, we have to. We have to preach that. There's nothing else but that message. So Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow. To further the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's our true purpose. I often tell people, you know, I forget and think I'm here at GCE to do curriculum development. No, I'm here to meet with you all to encourage you about God's word. I'm here to do prayer time and chapel. That's my true purpose. God's plan for your life. What is your true purpose? What does he want you to do? Jesus encourages his followers to forsake worrying and rely on God. Because he cares for us more than even creation that he spoke into being. I had a young uh, singer at chapel yesterday tell me that she's praying for God's will for her life because she's going to be graduating soon. So excited for her. And so she wants to know, what does God want me to do with my degree? She's still not sure. So I prayed for her this morning. How exciting it is that she's this young 20-something-year-old girl about to embark on her true purpose, and she's seeking God's will. Wow, that's amazing. That's something I never did until I was like 40-something years old. <laughs> so what a blessing it was to see a young woman seeking God, wanting to further his kingdom with her gifts and talents. So we must remember to rely on God because he knows, he sees us, he hears us, he cares for us. He knows what you need. There's no guessing with him. And then we fall back into that old trap. Remember? Well, why do we pray then if God's plan is settled and he's sovereign and our prayer doesn't change anything, then why pray? Well, a few months ago, I taught an entire Bible study on the purpose of prayer. We pray because Jesus prayed and taught us to pray. We pray because we're commanded to in the scriptures. Pray without ceasing. We pray because Jesus taught us how and when and why to pray. We pray to God to worship him, to thank him for even hearing our prayers. To show him that we rely upon him and not the world. We pray before we suffer. We pray before we serve. We thank him for prayers. That's why we pray. It's part of God's sovereign plan. When we pray and you know, pray for someone's salvation, like, like my son, or we pray for someone to be healed, we're not asking God to change his plan. We already know his plan, and we rest in that. Instead, he takes our prayers and he puts it into his plan, his beautiful, perfect plan that's existed since before time began. Our prayers are part of that plan. Isn't that beautiful? So that's why Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow, 
for tomorrow will worry about its own things. So why add to that? It's not going to help us. God's plan is perfect. So seek God first and his righteousness and all the things that you need will be provided. That's a promise that God had made. Then he swore on his deity that he would follow through with that promise. So what does it look like to seek God and his righteousness? Well, remember Horatio Spafford. The reason I named this Bible study what it is, the beautiful song that he wrote. This is what it looks like. Remember his story. He and his wife had a wonderful business in Chicago. Their little boy died of scarlet fever, and then the Chicago fire burned down everything. But he rebuilt his business and had a ministry and supported a ministry in England. So he sent his wife and daughters to England ahead of time because he had some business in Chicago. He sent them ahead of time, and their ship sank. She made it alive, but their four daughters perished, drowned in the ocean. And instead of cursing God and saying, I want nothing to do with God anymore. He's just been too mean to me. He keeps taking and taking from me. Instead of that, he hopped on a boat, sailed across to meet his wife to further ministry, And on the way there, he wrote these words, when peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Oh, just moves me to tears every time. Because he's saying whether I have peace and prosperity and everything's great, or whether I have sorrow, that just keeps coming and coming like the sea over and over again. Whatever my lot, God has taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. That's what it looks like to live your life furthering the kingdom of God and trusting him no matter what. And he and his wife went on to be missionaries in Jerusalem, and they have a plaque there to this day honoring their service. So what are some takeaways you have from this study? I know for me, First Peter, right, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And also about the armor of God, the importance of putting on that helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, every part of it, and having the sword of truth Knowing God's word will get you through those hard times. That's what I've learned, not just through this study, but over my life. God has reminded me of his faithfulness throughout my life. And remember, we were reminded of the advocate, the great advocate who defends us better than any earthly defender could do, right? We, we know that he searches the heart's And knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints. That's the, that's what the advocate does for us. The counselor, the comforter, the helper. So we were reminded about that, that we can tune into that power at any moment. And then we were taught about God's perfect plan that when we cry out to Jesus, like Hannah did, right? That we will have that peace that passes all understanding. Hannah gave us the perfect example of how to cry out to God when we are afflicted, when everything around us doesn't make any sense, when our personal health is gone and we're wondering, why, God, why? I don't understand. She gave us that perfect example. Her prayer is one that we all can learn from. We can praise God that he gave us this example. When our hearts are broken, we can cry out like Hannah did. We also learned about God's rest. Remember, Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And we learned that that word rest means cease from labor, cease from striving, just cease and be still, and you will be restored. Your strength will be restored. That's what that word means. That's what we learned. So when we read those words, we find comfort knowing 
in the world, we do not have rest. There's burden, there's work, there's worry, right? Fear, anxiety, problems. Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. And then we learned that that rest is freedom because that yoke of Jesus is different than the yoke of the world, remember? And there's freedom in Christ. And there's that that oxymoron, it doesn't make any sense because in Romans 6, we're told that we're either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness, right? Slaves to Jesus or slaves to the devil. But we understand in that word freedom that that's the true freedom we want. There's liberty in knowing we have rest. And then we were reminded of the truth that what keeps us from casting all of our cares and anxieties on him? That's right. Pride, ego, sin. And I learned that, remember? Holding on to those worries and that, you know, holding on to our cares gives us that feeling of power. But it's all foolishness. There is no power in holding on to all that. So I learned over the years to cast all my cares at the feet of the one who loves me. Pride is what keeps us from doing it. We think, well, I can handle this. I give God all my big problems, but I can handle this. He's busy over there helping people in Afghanistan. I can handle this problem. That's pride. And we're warned that goes before destruction. So Peter said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and cast all your cares at his feet. That's what we're told. So what are some of the most difficult aspects of trusting God and humbling yourselves before him to seek help? Well, sometimes it's we re revert to the old ways, remember? Everything's going well. Everything's going well. We're in Bible study. We're in ministry. We're in prayer time. Everything's, we're in church. You know, it's fun, fun, fun. And then something bad happens and we go back to our old ways of worry and isolation, and fear, and not trusting in God. That's exactly what the book of Hebrews outlines. And that's why we're going to go over the book of Hebrews in our next Bible study, because that's what the people were doing. They had all this pressure from Rome and the Jewish leaders, and many of the people in the new church had never seen Jesus. He had been dead for many, many years. They had only just heard about him and heard about him. So they went by eyes. What can we do? Oh, yeah, the temple and the priests and the law and the synagogues. Let's go back to that way because that makes us feel comfortable. And so that's what we do. Things are going great. And then when things go wrong, we go back to worrying and fear and anxiety because it makes us feel like we're in control. But that's not control, is it? So Jesus longs to exalt us. Remember, he is the way, the truth, the life. God longs to exalt us. That's what Peter told us in 1 Peter. He wants to rise us up above the fray, uplift us above the fray, and provide for us that peace of mind that we seek. That's what I learned from this lesson. What about you? How does the fact that God cares for you that much more than creation affect your ability to humble yourself before him enough to cast all your cares, not just some, all of them on his feet? Because that's what he wants to do. He loves you so much. And that's why we pray to worship him, to show him, to show the world that we trust in him. And I learned about the power of God, remember, and that peace of God that passes all understanding. Now notice Paul didn't say, pray about everything with thanksgiving and God will answer your prayers. That's not what he wrote. He said, in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. That's what we want more than anything. 
the peace of God. And that's what I'm praying for those missionaries in Afghanistan and Haiti who are in fear and they're desperately trying to calm their people down. I'm asking for the peace of God to go to them and just overtake them and guard their hearts and their thoughts. And we learned about that power of God. Remember, inside of us, the very power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. That's what Paul told the early church. And that's what he's telling us in his word. So then why would we have fear and anxiety, right? If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. But we go by our eyes and we look at the news and we look at the internet and we look at what's around us and the flood waters rising, but we need to stay focused on that. The truth, the truth is we have God. He's not, you know, Jesus wasn't this boastful, arrogant, proud teacher. No, he gave us the example of humility and he sought the father every day for the father's will and that agenda. What would you have me do for you today, God? And he said, I always do the Father's will. That's the Jesus that we have. That's the Savior we were given. So we have the perfect example of how to face trials with humility and grace. So look to Jesus for that peace of mind that you seek. That's the truth that we've been given in this Bible study. The knowledge of if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, God may exalt us in the due time and that we cast all of our cares on him. Why? Because he cares for us. That's the knowledge, the power. That's the knowledge that we have that the world doesn't have, that we need to get to the world. That knowledge. Trusting in God like Horatio Spafford did. Are we at that place where when things are great, we um, say it is well? And when things are horrible, we say it is well. That's the goal to get to that part, that moment in our life. Because only then can we have victory in Jesus that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians. That's the goal, victory in Jesus. And we are already victorious because of Jesus. He said, in this world, you will have troubles, but rest assured, I have overcome the world. So we are already victorious when we remember and turn to him. So I thank you ladies for joining me on this journey through all these verses that remind us not to have fear and anxiety. Now, if you have, I don't have her book with me, but if you have Sarah Morrison's book, it is well, there are still more passages that she goes over. We were only able to do eight weeks worth, but there are still more that she analyzes. So I highly recommend her book. It's wonderful. It helped me personally get through 2019. (laughs) And so that's why I wanted to share it with you. So pick up a copy of her book over at Daily Grace Company. And I look forward to next week when we start Jesus, The Better Rest, an overview of the book of Hebrews. I think you're really going to like it. I had so much fun putting that together. I think I taught it maybe three years ago. Wow, it's been that long. So I'm looking forward to breaking bread with you again next week. I love you all. I thank you all. I ask God to bless you. Let's pray. Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your word that you've given us, that you did not leave us here alone. And I do pray for those missionaries in Haiti and Afghanistan that you would go to them right now and let them know the saints are praying for them, lifting them up in prayer and asking for peace to just wash over them and strength, the power of God to just flow through them so when their enemies see them, they are just shocked and they fall to the ground when they see you, you know, emanating from them, from their eyes, from their words, everything, Lord. That's our prayer, that you be glorified. Give them strength to endure. Give them rest to endure. Uphold them, Lord, with your mighty right hand in ways that we know you can do. I thank you for my friends here joining me, Lord. Be with them throughout the rest of the week. You know what they're dealing with, what their issues are, what their burdens are, Lord. Be with them and love them. And we love you, Lord, so much. And thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, ladies.
Good to see you, Shelly, always. Bye, Tracy. We'll have to do coffee real soon. <laughs> and be blessed, and we will see you next time.